Welcome to the AfterSpark Podcast, an episode-by-episode recap of the Generation 1 Transformers cartoon. I'm Els. And I'm Spex. And today, we're not actually talking about an episode. We're talking about the 1986 movie. Let's talk about giant robots today, shall we? Yes, time to talk about Transformers the movie. Let's get to it. But first, uh, apologies. I know this is coming out late. Uh, November and December kind of kicked our ass. Yeah. Um, and then I had multiple computer problems <laughs> on top of the medical issues I was already dealing with. So I'm just saying, it's been a fun couple of months. Uh, hopefully this gets out by like March. <laughs> exhausting couple of months. Oh, so exhausting. Anyway, as I said, the The Transformers, the movie, I swear that's how it's actually written out, uh, was released on August 8th, 1986. It is a direct continuation of the original G1 series, taking place between the second and third seasons. Hence why we are discussing it now. Mm Mm-hmm. The screenplay is credited to Ron Friedman, according to the TF Wiki. He was primarily responsible for maintaining character dialogue consistency between different episodes for the first two seasons of G1. However, it is worth mentioning that Flint Dilly, a story editor for the original series, played a significant part in rewriting uh, Friedman's original script into the final version, but is only listed as a story consultant in the credits. It was considered a box office failure and was not well reviewed by most critics at the time of its release. Hmm. What? You mean a movie that was made to entirely sell toys didn't win over the critical audience? Well, especially not with all of the death. Yeah. All of the death. <laughs> so much trauma for the children. Pretty much. Um, in years since, it's become something of a cult classic, especially within the Transformers fandom itself, basically. Mm-hmm. And we've certainly made no secret that we think it's a better film than the Bay movies. But let's talk about our own experiences with our first time watching the movie. Uh, Specs? So I'm pretty sure I checked it out many a time from Blockbuster, along with the VHS tape that included the creation of the Dinobots, because they were the only Transformers tapes that particular Blockbuster had. And then... <laughs> yeah, remember when Blockbuster was a thing, guys? <laughs> yep. Oh, showing my age here. <laughs> Ancient. (laughs) And then I poked my dad into getting me a DVD copy off of eBay back in the day. And so I ended up with the movie. A very decrepit looking DVD case that it came in. Because, oh boy, does that thing look dated now. And it looked dated then. And the second half of season two, though that I'm pretty sure I got from Right Stuff Entertainment. And boy, was that expensive for the time. Yeah, the the movie DVD really does show its age. Like, animated menus. Animated menus everywhere. Yep, and the the warning against piracy includes drawing on the face of the FBI, dude. (laughs) And that's not included in any of the current stuff. I'm pretty sure you showed me your copy, because you had none of the fancy new ones. Yeah, no, it looks very different. So as for me, as you're all probably aware, I did not grow up watching the Transformers and I definitely didn't yet exist when this movie was originally released. So I believe my first time watching it was a movie night I had hosted where we watched this and the first Bay movie. And I should mention that this was well before I actually sat down and watched the G1 series because rather unfortunately, I don't think this movie is super friendly for a noob uh, to jump in on. And so while the animation again looks quite lovely and I appreciated that, I got bored and definitely dozed off. So I didn't have much of an opinion the first time I watched it. Well, I'm pretty sure I'm the one that bothered you into putting them on for the movie night because what, we did it for my birthday or something? I don't remember. I just, I, I like, I love watching like two of the same thing or two from the same franchise and comparing them. And that was definitely what the thought process was. The original animated movie versus the Bay movies. Yeah. And the first Bay movie is the shortest, so I think yeah. that's why we went with that. And honestly, the least egregious. Oh, definitely. But now, to the movie. The beginning of this movie is just fucking beautiful, by the way. Like, it's beautifully rendered, beautifully scored, and it is super ominous. In, like, the best way possible. Yep. The concept work for this movie was fantastic. We open on a planet full of humanoid mecha aliens. The planet is then probably eaten by a different huge metal planet, uh, presumably killing most of its inhabitants. 
Well, given some of the dialogue from later, yes. Yes. Uh, think of all the robot women and children that died, and the scientists. Oh no, not the scientists. <laughs> um, but as the menacing planet approaches, the inhabitants call it Unicron. Oh, Unicron. We've definitely never heard of him before, which, I mean, we haven't. Not in G1, anyway. Yeah. The movie proper starts with showing our title, uh, while a bitchin' version of the Transformers theme plays, like, legitimately, this is my favorite version of the theme. It's, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> It, it is, it's fantastic. <laughs> Guitar! <laughs> Guitar riffs. <laughs> Sick beats. And as with most movies, we see that they pulled in some pretty big name actors to play some of the newer characters. Folks such as Leonard Nimoy, Orson Welles, Eric Idle, Judd Nelson, etc. Um, mercifully, the original cast does make a return for basically any existing characters with speaking lines. The movie takes place in the far-flung sci-fi future of... 2005. I wish. <laughs> Boy, it's been 13 years, man. <laughs> yeah, and I still don't have giant robots or flying cars. I yep. call hacks. Yep. Meaning that nearly 20 years have passed in universe since the end of season two. Spike and Carly are now adults and have a son named Daniel. Daniel will basically be our main child character from this point forward. Sadly, none of the other human characters, including Sparkplug, Raul, or Chip, will make an appearance in this movie or beyond. Sparkplug was slated to be in the Season 3 episode, The Five Faces of Darkness, Part 1, so perhaps we can assume the poor guy's happily retired somewhere instead, being perhaps the most interesting man in the universe, somewhere having a happy retirement. We can only hope. I, I hope Daniel knows his grandpa, his grandpa I'm just saying. Uh, some other things that have happened in the interim 20 years, the Autobots seem to no longer have a presence on the actual surface of Cybertron, begging the question of what the hell happened to Aelita and her girls, but what do all I know? The Autobots now have moon bases on Cybertron's two moons, where they're monitoring Decepticon activity. And then we go to Laserbeak, flying around one of the bases. He gets to move his little wings today! I know that sounds super silly, but do you want the birds are so static that I'm like, yay, movement! <laughs> They've got the budget for it now. They've got the budget in this movie. They can afford to not be cheap. <laughs> Mostly. Laserbeak overhears the Autobot plans for making a special run to Autobot City on Earth for a final confrontation with the Decepticons. Basically, grabbing the Energon, bringing it back, and then presumably going to fisticuffs. A fuel run for Energon. This is the first time we see the Autobots specifically needing Energon cubes. It's mostly been a Decepticon thing till now. Yep. Jazz calls Moonbase 2 to check with Bumblebee and Spike and see about any nearby Decepticon activity. Not having any reported Decepticon activity, Ironhide, Prowl, Ratchet, and Brawn take off in a shuttle to Earth. Laserbeak returns to the Decepticon base on Cybertron to report in. Megatron commenting on how Laserbeak... For one, never fail, Sim, and Starscream looks so offended by this. <laughs> Sorry, Starscream, you're not the best verb. Laserbeak is the best verb. <laughs> Soundwave plays the recording back of Optimus sending the others out for the fuel run. In space, sometime later, presumably, Megatron attacks the Autobots Earthbound shuttle, ripping a hole in the side. You know, I'm surprised none of these shuttles have anything like rear view cameras. <laughs> you would think! I feel like they kind of need it. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, even just for space debris. I I presumably they have some kind of radar or something, but why it didn't pick up on the Decepticons, I have no idea. Sorry, I told myself I wasn't going to make that sort of side comment, and here we are. <laughs> so Megatron has in tow uh, Starscream, Soundwave, Dirge, Ramjet, Skywarp, Shrapnel, and the Constructicons. However, we see several other Decepticons involved later on that we didn't see actually into the shuttle, so... Who the fuck knows whether they're in the shuttle or they are followed behind or what? Who knows? It's a toy commercial, basically. <laughs> it, it really is. Again, the animation is superb. The joints on the robots, the smoke effects, the lighting, the coloring. Fewer animation and coloring errors here. Transformers never looks this good again, which is sad. Uh, not saying the 3D models that are used in later series or even the movies necessarily are bad, but this is just beautifully cinematic in a way that I don't feel like we see again. It's just, this is very charming for all of the general subject matter that we're covering right now. <laughs> Speaking of which, let the massacre begin! <laughs> Alright, so first off, we have Braun 
with uh, death by being shot in the shoulder by Starscream wielding Megatron. And Megatron did not bring the blanks this time. And evidently the cons have been taking aiming glasses in the last couple of decades because usually they can't hit the broadside of a barn. Yep. Uh, so second, Prowl dies pretty horrifically with smoke pouring out of his mouth and eyes after getting shot in the torso by Scavenger. He's also, like, graying up here. So, uh... <laughs> and we have Ratchet, uh, who is shot several times in the torso by Starscream, again, with Megatron in gun mode. Yep, there is a very slow, sad collapse here. Oh, yeah. And then, last, Ironhide. Also shot by Starscream, but hangs on long enough to cling to Megatron's leg and beg him no. Where and then Meg Megatron just shoots him point blank in like the head with his fusion cannon. Yep, it's a really good film shot uh, and probably the most threatening Megatron's ever looked in G like the G one cartoon continuity. Yep, it's like they're really hammering in that things mean business. Yep. Yep, by offing four bots immediately. <laughs> yep, four well-known and beloved characters. I miss Ratchet. <laughs> Same. Like, out, out of those four, Ratchet's the one that I really, like, legitimately miss the most. Yep. The Decepticons take over the shuttle and head toward Earth, intending to infiltrate and destroy Autobot City? What's Which is shuttle? a new city that the Autobots have basically built, whereas they don't really say, but it's Metroplex. I know, I know we did that, that, uh, OVA, and, like, it was clearly Metroplex there, but keep in mind, the American audience, this is not terribly well explained. Yeah. <laughs> so, to reiterate, again, how beautifully the animation here is in comparison with the rest of the series, or the, the series as a whole, aside from the movie. In just some nice motion things, uh, we see the jets fly over to the driving seats in the shuttle before sitting down instead of walking. Mm -hmm. It really drives home that these are giant robots that don't move in the same way that we would. And then in the next scene, we're introduced to Daniel and Hot Rod. And we see that they've animated their reflections in the water as the two are out fishing in this really beautific lake Picturesque. <laughs> yes. With like the snowy mountains in the background. It's gorgeous. I'm so curious. I'm like, are y'all still in the Cascades? Because I feel like you probably are, but I don't think we see the arc again after this. Yeah. So I have no fucking idea. Anyway, we have Hot Rod. He is a red and yellow bot with flame decals that turns into a futuristic race car. He's played by Judd Nelson in the movie or, you know, the jerky punk from The Breakfast Club. <laughs> yep. I have no idea if he's done anything recently. I feel like I looked it up and it wasn't like stuff I recognized, but I feel like he's like had work, but I, I don't actually like remember details. Yeah, I may look that up later. Um, Hot Rod is played in the series proper by Dick Gautier. That would be my guess. Who, while having a long and varied career, doesn't have any other notable Transformers roles. Sadly, much like several other characters, I think this Roddy is kind of boring, uh, but infinitely better here than by the end of the movie. Um, for my money, I personally prefer the IDW Lost Light Roddy because he's dealing with interesting problems and being in charge all while being kind of terrible at actual management. <laughs> yep. So Daniel is like Spike, but like H because we need to have a child character, a viewpoint character for the children. Yeah. For the children! Because <laughs> children don't like teenagers at all. It's fine. Um, well, we need to have something to grab all of the kids' attention now that we've alienated them all by killing their favorite <laughs> characters. You're not wrong! I, I just remember Power Rangers tried to do the same thing at some point where they're like, here, here's this eight-year-old, and all of the children hated him. Oh, so that's not surprising. Exactly. <laughs> Hot Rod and Daniel seem to be good friends, though we aren't given any backstory as to why, neither here or in the cartoon series. Hot Rod is Daniel's hot pink unpaid babysitter. I mean, he's actually a decent child minder because he keeps Daniel from dying. <laughs> and it's a pity we don't get to see the misadventures of Daniel and Hot Rod. Honestly, that sounds really cute and I kind of wish we did get that. <laughs> Daniel pulls out a tracking device that lets them know a shuttle is coming and Hot Rod drives Daniel to Lookout Mountain to get a better view. But not before he hops on a hoverboard and nearly kills himself before being caught by Hot Rod. Yep, this child nearly died two minutes into this film. 
And who even knows how much that hoverboard costs? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, did, did like Wheeljack or Percy make that for you and that's why you're not worried? But I mean, it, the, the pits and pieces of it just get left in yep. this bucolic wilderness area. <laughs> But we are treated to more of the movie's banger soundtrack, uh, Dare by Stan Bush, which is personally my favorite song in the movie. Dare, I didn't believe you can survive. Sorry, I really like it too. No, I, again, the soundtrack of this movie is great if you love kind of 80s, like, rock ballad bullshit. It is fantastic. It is my favorite thing. <laughs> so... Hot Rod and Daniel get to, you know, the top of Lookout Mountain and spot the shuttle using apparently shuttle watching binoculars that are just there. <laughs> and uh, Daniel sees a hole in the shuttle and sees Starscream through it. Good job, guys. Just stand out in the open, why don't you? <laughs> All right. So let's pause and go down our list of new characters. Or at least most of the main cast we're going to be dealing with. So we have Cup. He is a grumpy old man who turns into a teal futuristic pickup truck. And there's some back and forth dialogue that we see uh, between him and uh, Hot Rod that shows that they have some friction. It's like the age versus youth. We've got to have that there. Yeah, you know, it's very much like old man versus, you know, this, this youngin who doesn't know what he's doing. So Cup is voiced in the movie by Lionel Stander who was an actor with a career stretching back into the 1930s. Once in the series proper, he's voiced by a series regular, John Stephenson. Or Thundercracker's VA, who evidently was one of the only ones, or, or was the only one from like the original main cast in season one to not appear in the movie because Thundercracker has no lines. Yeah. And then there's Springer, a green triple changer who can transform aside from his robot mode, into a helicopter and a car. He's voiced by Neil Ross, who also voiced Bone Crusher and Hook. Huh, that is that is a good bit of uh, variation there. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> R.C., our first reoccurring female character, pink with Princess Leia hair buns. I regret to inform all of you of the designer's own words, which were, R.C. is the naked mechanical equivalent of Princess Leia from Star Wars. Like, dude, I know it's not a surprise, but seriously... Way to say the the quiet part out loud. <laughs> yep. R.C. is voiced by Susan Blue, who has had a few bit parts in the series, but most notably was the voice director for Beast Wars, Beast Machines, and Transformers Animated. She also voiced the R.C. in Transformers Animated. Yep. If I'm remembering properly. Yes. Uh, Blur, he is a blue Cybertronic race car, but he talks super, super fast. <laughs> Voiced by John Machetta, who was in several commercials in the 80s, notably the Micro Machine commercials. Flawless casting, change nothing, go look up the Micro Machine commercials because this man talks so quick. <laughs> Talk a mile a minute, I bet. We talked about Ultra Magnus in the Scramble City episode, but he's a by-the-rules Autobot whose alt mode is a semi-truck pulling a car carrier trailer. In the movie, he's voiced by Robert Stack, an actor perhaps best known as Captain Rex Kramer in Airplane. Huh, I completely missed that. <laughs> Season 3 onwards, Ultra Magnus is voiced by series regular Jack Angel, who voices Omega Supreme, Astro Train, and Ramjet. So, after all the nonsense with spotting Starscream in the shuttle, Hot Rod fires on it, the bots in the shuttle fire back, and he and Daniel need to make a quick exit off the mountain. Yep, and like, Hot Rod confirms for himself using his x-ray sunglasses <laughs> or whatever that he can, like, Pull down. He's an 80s man. Of course he has x-ray sunglasses. <laughs> yep. And yeah, and then after the shooting, he grabs Daniel and they haul ass off the mountain by leaping off as the entire mountainside, like, comes apart because it's being shot at. So Blitzwing goes to fire on them, but is defeated by Cup with Looney Tune shenanigans. Yep. <sighs> Cup, Hot Rod, and Daniel make their way towards Autobot City. Autobot City, on the other hand, is under attack. We see Ultra Magnus, Percy, RC, Springer, and Blur responding to said attack. Ultra Magnus dishes out some orders. RC and Springer set about transforming Autobot City. Which seems to be transforming the city into some sort of defensive form, but not Metroplex. Maybe Metroplex is just having his extremely long, uninterruptible nap. Apparently. Percy uh, will notify Blaster to contact Optimus Prime for reinforcements. While Ultra Magnus and Blur will go to warn others. 
You'd think other people would be able to tell what with all the gunfire, but... Maybe they turned off their audios? I don't know. <laughs> That's a possibility. Maybe they've also got to get, I don't know, humans uh, decamped and evacuated. Yeah. We never actually see any of that, by the way. We do see some other bots running around, like, very, very background, but that would make sense. Like, if anybody was going to evacuate humans or something, it would be Ultra Magnus. Mm-hmm. I mean, honestly, it would have made sense to have... You know, the United States military basically responding to an attack on their shores, but we never see anything like that with this series because they never want to uh, get into it, which I can't really blame that much for. Yeah. So Insecticons eat through one of the blast doors on Autobot City's outer perimeter, just in time for Cup and Hot Rod to take advantage of the opening. On taking the the jump, because there while there was a ramp going to the door... There is now a gap. Uh, Cup, on taking the jump, crushes the head of either Kickback or a clone of Kickback. Percy arrives at Blaster's location to relay Magnus' orders to him. Blaster starts the transmission to Prime, but Soundwave sends out Rumble, Frenzy, Ravage, and Ratbat. All of whom proceed to destroy the satellite dish Blaster's using to transmit and break through the ceiling to get to Blaster's location. And of course, it wouldn't be Transformers without at least a few coloring errors. Rumble briefly looking like Frenzy. <laughs> yep. And the fact that Blaster is in basically this big ass glass bubble atrium thing. <gasps> oh, it seems like such a bad setup. It seems so indefensible. <laughs> yep. So very, uh, very vulnerable to attacks by small gremlins that like shattering things. And again, we mentioned Rat Bat prior, but he's a purple cassette that can turn into a bat. Uh, so Perceptor gets mobbed by uh, gremlins and yells at Blaster to save himself. Don't worry, Percy will live. He's not one of the casualties today. He's too new. But Blaster has some new cassettes to show off, and this time we get to see all of them. All right, so first off, we've got Ramhorn, Dark Red Rhino. Steeljaw, who's a yellow lion. Then Rewind, White and Black Humanoid. And Eject, a white and blue humanoid. And I don't remember who looks like who, but... One of the two is also miscolored as the other, so I'm so glad we can keep that proud, proud tradition of miscoloring the human cassettes. Yep. <laughs> Though personality-wise, they're at least supposed to have different interests. So Blaster's gremlins proceed to take on Soundwave's gremlins, and they are at the very least locked in combat. <laughs> Back to Arcee and Springer, who are still moving bits of Metroplex around before being joined by Hot Rod Cup and Daniel. We also get to see some corpses. Yup. So depressing. <laughs> Outside, Megatron orders the Constructicons to form Devastator. And then fighting continues to ensue. Optus finally arrives with Sunstreaker Hound and the Dinobots minus Snarl, who must be using his PTO, on board a separate shuttle, basically. As Optimus drives into battle with the touch playing in the background, also by Stan Bush, guys. <laughs> Again, he does the best parts of the soundtrack and no one can convince me otherwise. But Optimus begins mowing down Decepticons left and right, thrust and trap don't getting hit. So Optimus Prime does this epic transformation where he rockets himself upward with like hip jets and transforms in mid-air, doing like a big badass flip, real bitchin' move there, <laughs> and shooting the Decepticons at while well, he's mid-air, and it's it's all a thing. Then it's one shall stand and one shall fall as it's Optimus versus Megatron. It's a fun fight to watch as they're both pulling out different weapons and getting tossed around. Yep, Megatron and Optimus have to have their homoerotic fight, complete with Megatron switching his cannon off for a hot five seconds. <laughs> Megatron begs for mercy when Optimus, like... Gets the upper hand. <laughs> yeah, has the upper hand and Megatron is plotting something because... Hidden gun, hidden weapon. And then when Hot Rod attempts to warn Optimus and interfere, Megatron takes that interfering teenager hostage <laughs> and shoots Optimus multiple times in the torso. Despite being wounded, Optimus manages to knock Megatron off the area they're fighting on, leaving him prone on the ground below. Like, he falls down three giant robot stories. It's definitely, it definitely looks like he would take more damage than Optimus falling off a hill. I'll give him that. I'll give him that. Like, this at least looks like, yeah, he should at least have a few dents on him. Like, that was less falling off a hill and more rolling down. I know. I know. 
was ridiculous. <sighs> Death by hell. <laughs> but uh, Megatron being prone on the ground is something Starscream definitely takes advantage of, walking over and kicking him. Careful, Starscream. Is that the foot you shot earlier? <laughs> yeah. There was a point where, like, Starscream got his foot stuck, and, like, it looks like he shot it off, but then he's fine. So I'm like, okay, I'm glad to know that had no relevance on the plot, I guess. Starscream orders Astrotrain to transform and get them out of there. Megatron begs Soundwave to not leave him behind, because he's evidently injured enough he can't get up. And so Soundwave does not leave him behind. He picks Megatron up and carries him very, very steadily, stably, uh, as they flee. Like, there is no going up and down or bumping. It seems very solid. Uh, Rumble is lagging a bit behind Soundwave and the others, apparently having picked up Megatron's fusion cannon, so he's just running with the fusion cannon, which is like as tall as he is. It's amazing. Or even bigger. <sighs> the Decepticons retreat on Astro Train. So, Autobot City, Death Counter, at least the ones we were able to confirm. Uh, we have Huffer. Wind Charger. And Wheeljack. Yeah, who he didn't even get an on-screen death. Like, none of these three did, to my knowledge. So, yeah. <laughs> we just see corpses. And now for the scene that traumatized a generation. Optimus is dying. Yep. No doctors around anywhere. Apparently, uh, apparently Perceptor is not enough of a doctor. <laughs> Optimus is just too damaged. And apparently Hot Rod's medical skills are not up to the task. No one's medical skills are up to the task. And I assume since the satellite got busted that they can't call the uh, rescue bots. They're not rescue bots. What the fuck are they? Um, protect us. <laughs> protect us. <laughs> I'm like, no, 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 wrong show. <laughs> oh, Optimus says not to grieve because soon he'll be one with the Matrix, which uh, that's the first time we've heard of this, guys. Ah, yes, the Matrix of leadership, a reoccurring plot, McGuffin. Oh, going forward, yes. <laughs> in G1, it's basically an artifact that holds the collective knowledge of its previous holders, and it can sort of talk to the dead of the people inside, sort of, sometimes when the plot demands it. <laughs> well, when doesn't the plot demand it? I'm just saying, they can't just, they don't just, like, yank Optimus out for, you know, a conversation <laughs> over afternoon energon or something. They don't just haul him out for shits and giggles? No. It's only when Roddy is... Having his own out-of-body experiences or whatever. <laughs> so Optimus Prime tells Ultra Magnus that the Matrix will be passed to um, Ultra Magnus. And Magnus says he's not worthy, but Optimus says something about lighting their darkest hour, blah, 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 till all are one. <laughs> I think this is the first we've heard of me, till all are one thing. And the music swells, and Optimus dies turning gray. His head falls limply to the side for maximum drama. Optimus has been uploaded to the cloud. <laughs> we told you how the Matrix worked. He got uploaded to the damn cloud. <laughs> the cloud, which you can only access on this one elect selective device. Yep. On Astro Train, the Decepticons are having a bit of an issue. Starscream decides to lead the Decepticons in a vote because... Apparently they need to toss some weight. So who wants to toss the most injured Decepticons to lighten the load or else they're not getting home? Uh, and the eyes have it, uh, so they, they toss them. And I'm legitimately kind of surprised he just tosses out Thundercracker and Skywarp, which are the ones we see him working with the most, but he does. The needs of the plot. <laughs> no, no. The needs of the scream outweigh the needs of the money. <laughs> So, naturally, the last one out is Megatron, which Starscream gloats about so much before he tosses Megatron out of Astro Train. And this isn't even how moving in space <laughs> works, guys! Ugh. But what I find fascinating is that Soundwave doesn't stop this. <laughs> Uh, which, he saved Megatron earlier, so, like, if anybody was going to do it. And so, my theory is that Soundwave prioritized the safety of himself and his cassettes over his dying leader. So he, you know, voted a big ol' yes on the Starscream's tossing Megatron initiative. I mean, I know the Decepticons could just all be backstabbing bastards, but I don't know. I find it more interesting if there's a little bit more than that, you know? Yes, but again, the needs of the plot. <laughs> The needs of the plot outweigh the needs of the many. 
So the TOS Decepticons consist of Megatron, Thundercracker, Skywarp, <laughs> and some Insecticons. Now, whether this was the actual Insecticons or clones is debatable since they show up later in season three, and whether those are original or clones, I don't fucking know. <laughs> God, maybe they're like the, um, God, it's a character in My Hero Academia. He can make clones, but he doesn't know whether he's an original or a clone. <laughs> so I guess that's just what life's like for an Insecticon. At this point. Maybe. <laughs> well, the rest are dead and I'm not, so I'm the original now. <laughs> I mean, heck, if you can still make the clones too. Yeah. Sure. So the Decepticons elect with multiple question marks here. A new leader through fisticuffs. Or, you know, they all have a giant fucking brawl in Astro Train. <laughs> and I, I would just like to take a moment to say, you know, Soundwave has everyone outnumbered if you count his cassettes. Uh, Soundwave for leader 2023. Or 2005, as it were. <laughs> <sighs> Soundwave superior, Constructicons inferior. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> to, quote, to quote some dialogue there. And at this point, I'm surprised Astro Train isn't just, you know pulling the perennial road trip threat. Don't make me turn this shuttle around. Considering they're all inside him and we don't hear him complaining about how they're fucking busting him up. Well, we're just being like, I'm in charge now, which I feel like would be an entirely reasonable thing for him to say. Yep. So Megatron and the remaining bodies and or half dead bots are drifting in space when either they happen upon or the giant robot planet Unicron happens upon them. Unicron informs Megatron that he was brought here for a purpose. Uh, Megatron's like, no one summons Megatron! And Unicron's like, then it pleases me to be the first. Uh, Orson Welles does such a good job here. So yeah, this is uh, Orson Welles' last role before his death. And he seemed pretty amused that he was playing a toy, even if that toy did not actually get to be a toy until like 2004. Three or something. I, I don't know. I, I would hope he would derive some bit of fun or amusement from it because it is inherently a pretty silly thing. Yeah. But hey, he got to be a giant planet eater for his last role. So Unicron orders Megatron to destroy the Autobot Matrix of Leadership as it's quite possibly the only thing that could get in Unicron's way. First we've heard about this. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of firsts here. Yeah. So Unicron offers Megatron a deal of sorts. A deal with the literal robot devil, as it were, even if we don't quite find that out for a little bit. Megatron will get a new body and troops, but he must go deal with the Matrix. Megatron's not super happy about this arrangement. He's like, he wants more competitive terms. <laughs> He tries for more, but Unicron says that Megatron belongs to him now. Megatron protests. Megatron belongs to no one! To which Unicron's response is, proceed on your way to oblivion. Which is, you know, an absolutely banger line. Megatron does ultimately take the deal with Unicron when Unicron starts to suck him in because he has some semblance of self-preservation. Yep. Uh, Unicron reformats Megatron and the remaining Decepticons, forming them into all new toys! I mean bots. The scene where Megatron is being reformatted looks super cool. I gotta love the 80s vaporwave aesthetic going on here. Also, uh, Megatron's magical girl transformation, anyone? These giant ass robots can have a magical girl transformation if they want to have one, <laughs> or if they're bestowed one by forces that they cannot control. <laughs> Megatron is getting a magical girl transformation whether he wants it or not. Happens multiple times in this in this show today. The Seekers and Insecticons are reformatted into Cyclonus, Scourge, and the Sweeps, and also the Armada, which is never seen or heard from again, so, uh... <laughs> Megatron is reformatted into Galvatron. The part of Galvatron will now be played by Spock. I hate it. I'm sorry. He does fine, but I really do think and this kills me inside to say this, Michael Bay actually utilized his Leonard Nimoy more effectively. <laughs> Part of the problem for you is that he, you are way more familiar with him as Spock, whereas this was quite literally probably the first thing I really noticed him in as an actor or he, voice actor. Yeah, well, it's either that or I heard him in other voice acting roles growing up, but yeah, he's... His voice is very recognizable, and it throws me off here so much. Anyway, Galvatron is silver and purple and turns into a Cybertronic treaded field artillery unit. 
okay, you know how we quoted R.C.'s designer earlier? Well, we're going to do that again because he's also the one who designed Galvatron. He said, and I quote, but about Galvatron, my inspiration for him was those stupid people, which, sir, what on earth does that even fucking mean? <laughs> I don't know, unless there was more of this. I, I That's all I had. That's all I could find on the TF wiki, to which I throw my hands up and say, no fucking clue. <sighs> but tangent time, because I find toy history fascinating. The likely reason for giving Megatron a different alt was probably due to a change in federal law in regards to toy guns. In the 80s, there were several instances of children with realistic toy guns being shot by police because they thought the children had real weapons. Um, the original Megatron figure, which turned into a gun, was grandfathered in, but any reissues or new toys based off that design wouldn't be, at least in the U.S., Hence the violently purple and orange laser gun artillery thing here, and why Megatron's more frequently been a tank or a jet in recent years. Yep. So then we've got Cyclonus, who is a purple mech with horns, or possibly bunny ears, that transforms into Galvatron's personal spacecraft. He's purple! <laughs> oh, we're back on the purple is the favorite color bandwagon, I see. And so Cyclonus is insanely loyal compared to Starscream. So there's a fic out there that basically logics that Cyclonus is what Megatron would have considered a perfect second command. And personally, I rather like that take. It makes him being purple even funnier. <laughs> mm -hmm. Would perhaps have been funnier if he'd been made out of Skywarp. So Scourge is blue and turns into a Cybertronian hovercraft and is in charge of an army of sweeps. Or a bunch of dudes that look just like him. We don't really know the exact number because it tends to fluctuate between episodes or shots sometimes. The replacement seekers. <laughs> Pretty much. But now they literally are completely nameless and um, personality-less. And also they're all the same damn color. Yes. Much easier to animate. <laughs> so the general consensus, at least on TF Wiki, is that Thundercracker was reformatted into Scourge. Skywarp was reformatted into Cyclonus, and the Insecticons were reformatted into Sweeps. But this is somewhat unclear to the point where Hasbro has poked fun on this with some of Cyclonus's toy packaging information. So, grain of salt here. And it's also super weird because the whole Armada thing is, for a split second when Galvatron is introducing Cyclonus and his, quote, Armada, there's a second Cyclonus who never shows up again, nor is his armada ever mentioned again. So, um, I don't know what's going on there. And I just assume they all get turned into sweeps because the armada doesn't exist except for a hot second when it did. <laughs> and it was one dude. And it was one dude. I'm like, that sir is not an armada. <laughs> Unless armada is literally a dude's name. <laughs> Which is possible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <sighs> then Unicron spits out a whole ass spaceship and tells Galvatron to destroy the Matrix of Leadership already. And now, back to Cybertron! And with Megatron's death, Starscream has decided it's time to crown himself Emperor! With... And he looks fabulous in his cape and crown! And his glorious accom accompaniment of trumpets! <laughs> yup! Which actually, the, stunt the Constructor Con should have included trumpets. Oh yeah, that would've been funny. Unfortunately for Starscream, that coronation is getting crashed as Galvatron arrives just in time to take offense at this. Shooting um, Starscream and Starscream crumbling into literal ash, which honestly is on par with how Prell died earlier. <laughs> I mean, it might be a little more horrifying because we don't see Prell exactly crumbling to ash where we definitely get horrified Starscream frozen in a rictus of death and then... There goes the corpse. I don't know. I think the smoke pouring out of his eyes and mouth looks more horrifying to me. But, you know, you, to each their own. <laughs> different strokes for different blokes, as I guess in terms of robot horror goes. <laughs> the other Decepticons possessing more than half a brain cell are all totally fine with Galvatron as their new leader after that display. Which, considering something that gets brought up in the third season, I mean, they figure out that he's kind of Megatron. Pretty fast. Yeah. Unicron rolls on up to Moonbase 1, where Jazz and Cliffjumper are, and starts chowing down. Jazz calls the Earthbots and informs them of the situation before losing radio contact. 
He and Cliffjumper attempt to escape, but their shuttle gets pulled into Unicron's maw, mimicking something we saw much earlier in this movie. Spike and Bumblebee quickly lose contact over radioing Earth as well. They set up explosives in an attempt to slow down or destroy Unicron and get in their shuttle, and now I'm wondering how fucking powerful those explosives were supposed to be. No idea. Unfortunately, the explosion doesn't actually do much to Unicron, and also Spike can finally swear. But only once! <laughs> it's the true mark of an adult. <laughs> yep. And unfortunately, they are unable to escape Unicron's gravity well, and their shuttle is shortly sucked into his waiting maw. So Galvatron takes issue with Unicron's eating of the moons, saying that Cybertron belongs to him. But he is quickly cowed by, I guess, the mind control Unicron installed um, uh, when he reformatted him. Unicron brought the mental torture, okay? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The Decepticons head to Earth to go deal with the Matrix of Leadership, just as the remaining Autobots on Earth are getting ready to head towards Cybertron. The Decepticons fire on the Autobots as they all head towards their shuttles. We see poor Blur attempting to get the Dinobots uh, on board a shuttle, but he is failing absolutely miserably. Begging the question of if anybody has just asked them to get on the damn things, I'm gonna vote no, because the Autobots just as a whole are super bad at treating the Dinobots like actual fucking people. RC and Roddy jump in and manhandle the Dinobots into the shuttle. We find out that Grimlock actually likes Cup's War Stories, which is just adorable. So in Shuttle 1, we have all the Dinobots, minus Snarl, who is certainly not appearing in this picture, Cup and Hot Rod. In Shuttle 2, we have Ultra Magnus, Percy, Springer, Daniel, and RC. The two shuttles head towards Cybertron. And Grimlock and the other Dinobots are finally getting story time from Cup, and they are all so happy, guys. <laughs> the Decepticons catch up with them and begin to fire on Shuttle 1. Cyclonus is able to inflict significant damage to the shuttle, causing it to crash. On a planet that will soon cause issues in the series. The Decepticons then begin firing on Shuttle 2, with Springer commenting on how the cons are going to keep dogging them until they see them dead. Getting an idea, Ultra Magnus separates the ship into two pieces over Perceptor's objections. Uh, allowing the cons to destroy the half of the ship that they're not on. <laughs> Basically, the we're going to let you kill a decoy while we escape. Pretty much. And but with Ultra Magnus supposedly destroyed, Galvatron celebrates his victory before more mind control nonsense and Galvatron orders their ship to return to Unicron. Ah, uh, yeah, time to torture your servant guy you're controlling. Back with the Shuttle 1 occupants, Roddy and Cup find themselves fending off some threatening metallic ocean denizens. Such as piranha fish and a giant squid. Cup is alive, but uh, missing some limbs after his bout with the giant squid. Meanwhile, Shuttle 2 has a rough landing on a planet of junk. The universe is garbage heap. This is Junkion. Daniel wants to go with everybody, but you know, alien planet, so... R.C. decides to give him Spike's old exosuit suit, which is... We don't get an explanation for why it's on this ship. <laughs> no, but I mean, I think it's a pretty solid idea. They're now in charge of a human child that yeah. they presumably... I, I don't know, man. I'm like, is is uh, Carly at a retreat in the woods or something? Or just they didn't have time to drop him off? I'll never know. But... Maybe she's off doing um, politics <laughs> or something. And very, very stressed about both why her husband and her son haven't called her in a few hours, in like a day. Yeah, especially if she's getting, like, news updates. Oh god, yeah. So, they exit the shuttle, and they're being watched by some threatening figures that rise from the garbage heaps. Yep. Uh, Roddy is able to repair Cup once they get out of the ocean. And per apparently, this, is, like, improves some physical things for Cup. <laughs> yeah, Roddy's true calling should have been to be a medic, I guess. Mm-hmm. And then the two decide to go off and find the Dinobots. And upon meeting some threatening looking robots, Cup greets them with the universal greeting, or Ba Weep Gra Na Weep Nini Bong, which we have never heard before this moment. He also gives them some inner dragon goodies, but once they run out, uh, the other guys get angry and attack. And the thing is, this is not supposed to be a one sided thing. <laughs> Apparently, it's supposed to be reciprocated. Because the Autobots mention that this is- well, Hot Rod mentions that this is getting expensive. <laughs> the bots then take them into what appears to be a courtroom of some kind. The bot on trial is proclaimed as innocent, 
and contrary to expectations, is dumped into a giant tank of shark decons to be torn apart for their captor's amusement. The judge is an alien that can be best compared to a floating egg with five rotating faces. This is a quintessence. They will be more important in season three. I don't even, do they even get a name here or is it just random? Like, did, did they even call them quintessence in the movie? I don't remember. I believe the, um, like the last survivor of the planet that we see getting eaten at oh, the beginning okay. calls them the quintessence. Okay, that's fair. Yeah, those are the shark decons and their cruel masters, the quintessence or something. And then he gets dragged out to uh, be murdered to death. <laughs> Cup and Roddy are thrown into a jail cell where we see a survivor from the planet in the opening. He gives them crucial information that's... It, it, it's useful. And, uh, yeah, he's pulled out for trial in short order after giving them some background on Unicron and Quintessence and promptly dropped into the shark dick on tank. Elsewhere, the four Dinobots are wandering around the planet, arguing, unsurprising to anyone. <laughs> they come across a small bot who speaks primarily... And probably entirely in rhyme. <laughs> this is Wheelie. He's an orange bot that turns into a mini car. He's described as young slash a child on TF Wiki. So I guess this is the first instance of an actual Cybertronian tile child, maybe? Um, so also he's voiced by Welker, which don't even ask me how that's a fucking thing. Um, also, seriously, go read his TF Wiki. Uh, it's free because holy shit, the entire thing is in rhyme. Whoever wrote that, you're a genius and a monster. <laughs> well, Wheelie is the mild boy of Quintessa, and Welker has the range between <laughs> Wheelie really has range. Holy shit! <laughs> between Wheelie and the Lion Roars and Megatron and whoever else he's done, he's done so many characters. Oh, I know. I'm rewatching Futurama, and every time um, Nibbler shows up, I just start laughing like a fucking hyena. <laughs> Also, Welker. <laughs> I am convinced, by the way, if they didn't know Nibbler could talk at the beginning of that, they had hired him to make cute, adorable animal noises, because I'm pretty sure Welker also does a boo. Um, and then they're like, oh wait, we need we need Nibbler to talk. Oh, not a problem, just have Welker do the voice. Such a talented man. <laughs> Tommy's done so much shit. <laughs> Galvatron arrives back at Unicron's location and gets an earful about finishing the job since... You fool, Ultra Magnus is still alive! The Decepticons descend upon Shuttle 2, destroying it, and everybody scatters. After a chase scene, Ultra Magnus seals the others off by shooting a bunch of junk down in front of them to cut them off from the Decepticons, and then he attempts to open the Matrix, but fails horribly and is shot to pieces <laughs> by the sweeps for his trouble. Literally exploding. Yep, yep, into pieces. Upon gaining the Matrix, Galvatron makes it known that this will be his surprise helping item in his quest to get rid of Unicron now. Back with Roddy and Cup, who are now on trial themselves. They have nothing but contempt for this court. And then they are dropped into the Shark Decon tank. Where they start driving on the walls underwater to make a vortex and drive up the sides to get out. Because, like, the force field bands that are keeping them from transforming, uh, those get let go once they're actually in the water. So they're free to transform and make the water a living hell for the Sharktacons because then they do an impromptu demolition derby. Once they get back on dry land, they transform into bot mode and begin beating up the Sharktacons with their bare hands. <laughs> like, they're like, we're not gonna win, but we can give them one hell of a repair bill. <laughs> and then they are saved by the timely arrival of the Dinobots, who also begin taking out the Sharktacons. And Roddy calls them bozos, and I'm like, just tell them thank you, you asshole! <sighs> yeah. Nobody is nice to the Dinobots, holy shit. Like, what is wrong with all of you? <laughs> the Sharktacons, uh, now, uh, seeing the tide is vastly against them, turn on their masters, allowing Roddy and company to escape in a nearby ship that Wheelie directs them to. Ultra Magnus' group is a morning when the vaguely threatening garbage figures from before show up. And these guys are riding motorcycles, who also turn out to be people. <laughs> Time to Mad Max it up in this garbage wasteland. Born to be stupid by Weird Al plays, I swear this is relevant. Oh, it is. It is. It is the most relevant. 
the Autobots and Junkion start fighting because apparently without Cup here, none of them can, well, without Cup or Ultra Magnus, none of them can attempt to establish diplomatic relations. Springer going all mano all mano with the lead Junkion. But it's Daniel that gets the last blow, bringing down a beam on the Junkion's head. Roddy and Co's weird spirally spaceship arrives. Hot Rod attempts the universal greeting, and this time it actually works. A dance party breaks out. <laughs> the universal greeting works with actual civilized people, even on the planet of junk. Which, of course, the people on the planet of junk speak, you know, of TV. So they actually have intergalactic culture. Apparently. So their leader is Retgar. He is voiced by Eric Idle in the movie and Tony Pope in the series proper. Fun fact, Tony Pope did the original Furby voice. <laughs> Retgar is all warm earth tones and turns into a motorcycle, like the majority of his people. Funnily enough, in Transformers Animated, he is voiced by Weird Al, which is why it is very funny to me that Born Movie Stupid plays during this scene. It's just such a fun song. <laughs> it is! Plus, it is so funny to me, like, how in more recent years, Weird Al has just done voice work, um, in addition to all the other shit he does. So, yeah, no, he's fun. The Junkions talk TV. They, they learned to talk from hearing intergalactic news, which apparently involves a lot of TV programs and commercials from the Earth. And they are very helpful and uh, put Ultra Magnus back together. Yes, yes, Ultra Magnus is just fine after getting blown to bits. Like, he's been decapitated. He's had his limbs removed. And I mean, well, they can't just bring in a new guy and kill him. That's not gonna sell toys. <laughs> So Magnus is happy that they're all alive, but is understandably distressed to learn that the Matrix is now in Galvatron's possession. As is, I think, Hot Rod and probably Cup. <sighs> Rekkar and the Junkions are also clearly keen on taking out Galvatron and I think probably Unicron? Maybe? Eh. To mm. which they raise a spaceship from the garbage and hop on board to join the Autobots in the Unicron beating. <laughs> While talking TV the entire time. Uh, Ultra Magnus, Percy, and the Junkions are on the Junkion ship. We also presume that Wheelie, Blur, and the Dinobots are on the Junkion ship too, as they aren't with the other group later. Yes, because there is a fairly justifiable reason why we can make this uh, distinction. Yes. As will be uh, shown. RC, Springer, Cup, Hot Rod, and Daniel are on the Quintessence ship. Back at Unicron, Galvatron is threatening his uh, employer with his new bling, as in he definitely has the, the Matrix on a chain. <laughs> <laughs> Unicron doesn't think much of Galvatron's attempt and suddenly transforms, revealing that he is an absolutely enormous humanoid transformer. Actually, you know what would have been funny? If his face was literally just hanging out in a cavern inside his <laughs> body, considering what they did in the comics, well, the Marvel comics with... Fucking Primus. Primus is basically a face on a wall. Yes. <laughs> <sighs> so Unicron then starts to go to town on Cybertron trying to rip it apart. Yep. This is specifically to get back at Galvatron. Yes. Actually. Not because he fucking hates Cybertron itself. It's basically, I, I am going to punish you by destroying your home planet. And we see one final shot of Shockwave ordering an evacuation, and he is never seen again. Yeah, he's presumed dead at this point, but if you're writing fan fiction, the argument can be made that he's just, like, retired to, like, <laughs> Space Tahiti or something. <laughs> the Decepticon, you know, he was so, sorry, he was so loyal. I could actually see him refusing to serve Galvatron. Mm -hmm. As weird as that sounds. Um, not that he ever met Galvatron during the movie, I think, except maybe during the coronation sequence. Tangent, sorry. The Decepticons fire back on Unicron, but don't make much headway. Yep, and then Unicron swallows Galvatron. It's bas he basically holds him between his thumb and forefinger and then drops him in his mouth, and it's pretty fucked up. <laughs> Boar. <laughs> Robot more. <laughs> We've arrived. Ah! <laughs> mm. The Autobots and Junkions arrive. Autobots steering the Quintessence ship so that it drills through one of Unicron's eyes, getting the group inside Unicron mostly safely. Yep. They all leap out of the ship at some point and then uh, kind of get separated. 
everybody but Hot Rod comes under fire from some of Unicron's internal systems. Congratulations, guys. You are now the virus. Hot Rod manages to find his way to Galvatron and the Matrix. Galvatron attempts to team up with him against Unicron, but given Unicron's mind control and or torture nonsense, he ends up succumbing and fires on Hot Rod instead, going straight for murder. <laughs> Pretty much. The Dinobots start tearing into Unicron from the outside, but Unicron waves them away. More or less, he's treating them like a fly that's trying to bite his butt. Pretty much. Upon firing upon some, like, large prehensile claw thingies attacking Daniel, RC actually breaks open a fluid line of some kind, which sweeps the entire group away in a flood. Daniel is separated from them, washing into an area where robotic life forms are being dropped into some kind of smelting pool. Spike informs us that it's acid, because he's up there on the, the claw conveyor line, too. Yeah, Spike, Jazz, Cliffjumper, and Bumblebee are all up on this, like, conveyor line that's carrying them towards the pool. And, uh, Spike tells Daniel to blast it. Or to blast the cover, because there's a cover for the pool. For some reason. So Daniel's able to bring the lid down over the pool and the four safely land on top. Along with presumably whoever was behind them. If they're still alive. Yeah. <sighs> Back with Galvatron, he's hunting them pesky hot rods. <laughs> A firefight between the two ensues. Galvatron attempts to choke Hot Rod, but Hot Rod manages to grab the Matrix. Opening it and gaining the fabulous powers of the Primes. And unfortunate wrinkles. It looks like he's got frown lines now. He also, well, Hot Rod becomes Rodimus Prime, with the most lackluster magical girl transformation. He just gets bigger. It's space Winnebago time, guys! Yep. Galvatron got a better magical girl transformation. Just showing you that in this universe, evil has a sense of style. Rodimus throws Galvatron through a wall, sending him flying into space, where he'll definitely never bother anyone ever again. Why do I hear boss music? Rodimus completes opening Matrix, which causes Unicron to explode? To, to blow to bits? Why is never explained, guys? Uh... It's the MacGuffin that makes him explode, and God, you will never- Well, you've probably already heard about the the Unicron Singularity, but this is more or less the, inst the thing that instigated that, aside from Hasbro. Our heroes make a hasty exit from Unicron's remaining eye. Oh, an eye for an eye, guys. An eye for an eye. <laughs> but, but, but they took out two eyes! <laughs> Yes. I, sorry, I guess it doesn't mean it has to be the other guy's eye. It can just be an eye for an eye on the same guy. Okay. <laughs> yep. And then Rodimus declares that the war is over. There are no Decepticons here. This is a unilateral decision. <laughs> and Unicron's head floats ominously around Cybertron as the credits roll. How traumatizing <laughs> must this be? The, the head, the giant decapitated head of the giant robot that was destroying your home world is now your moon. Well, the other two moons got eaten. <laughs> yes, but this is a sucky replacement moon. It is a sucky replacement moon, yes. So, uh, final thoughts? I find the movie n pretty nostalgic, because I ended up watching it more before I watched pretty much the rest of the series, and I still like it a lot better than the Michael Bay movies, even though several of my favorite characters die. <laughs> I really enjoy the animation and the music, and I enjoy the background art. It's just visually and sound-wise, it is an enjoyable experience. And I enjoy yelling at all the dumb things the giant robots do. Or the strange decisions that were made by the people making this movie. I mean, I need to call the robots out, Owls, and also retroactively, I guess, call out the makers of the movie. You did this to yourself, Unicron, by eating the guy with the thing you want to destroy. That was a terrible choice. It was a terrible choice. Like, I'm like, God, or Unicron, what did you think was going to happen? I, I have questions. So for me, unfortunately, I mostly just feel frustrated with this movie. Like, they kill all the characters off and then hand us a bunch of new ones that I don't know why I should care about. I, I will grant that I'm happy that Percy and Grimlock are here and alive and have some relevance to the plot. Um, also, the voice casting, aside from Orson Welles, just seemed unnecessary. Most of them don't come back for the series proper. 
They, they really just wanted some star power to bring in people for their lackluster toy commercial, okay? <laughs> it's a two and a half, it's an hour and a half long toy commercial. Pretty much. I definitely understand why people like this movie. And, like, I I think my problem is just not the movie I would have wanted. I, again, music and animation are pretty damn great. And I love the soundtrack. And the backgrounds and concept work that went into it. And unfortunately, like, the things that this movie did that carry into season three, some of which I'm not very fond of, because um, say what you will, I think the show is far less entertaining without Starscream in it. And while he will come back very, very briefly, um, him not being in basically the rest of the series is a really huge change in the cast that I do not like. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, without that internal conflict... Uh, in the Decepticons, and with the Decepticons in such a bad poor, state, yes, starting bad, season three, yeah, a bad state. It's there's just less uh, interesting interaction for them mm-hmm. to have. I also think, like, my problem with the new characters is I don't think they're particularly interesting. Like, Roddy doesn't have Prime's charisma. I enjoy Cyclonus in principle. Like, look, the idea of you go from Starscream, who's the most traitorous bastard to ever live, to Cyclonus, most loyal dude that ever existed. Like, it's it's a really fun comparison, but I just don't think he's terribly well executed. Mm-hmm. Like you said, he was better executed in fanfiction. Pretty much. And then, oh, oh, Galvatron. Gal, buddy, my good man, I will come for you later. Mm-hmm. Spoiler, I don't like the direction they take Galvatron. Um, I guess to paraphrase, you, you've you heard me talk for quite a while at this point. I really like Megatron. I think Megatron's interesting. He's also a fucking dumbass. So, you know, he has all the things I like about an 80s villain. Mm-hmm. Galvatron is just insane. <laughs> yep. They don't really connect the new characters with the old ones very well. Like, Cup has all these war stories, but we never heard, hear him talk about any of the other older characters that have died or we just don't see, like, just having him call back to doing something with Ironhide. Yeah. Or partying with Ratchet or something. <laughs> yeah, like, Ratchet wasn't, like, he's like, oh, no, Ratchet was the party ambulance or something. But do you know how funny that would be? The man is not alive, but Ra- is not alive anymore to tell anybody he's wrong. <laughs> mm-hmm. And Optimus dying isn't really brought up in any meaningful way until the very end of season three when they did... The hate plague. Yeah, like, they're just, it doesn't feel like there's any weight to the people who died, which no. seems very odd. I mean, it's definitely odd cons- compared to the media that our generation is making now, but compared to the story writing in the 80s, eh, to me, it more or less feels on par, I guess. Yeah. So, in regards to removing Starscream, Unfortunately, Dilly has claimed in personal interviews that Chris Lotta frequently had to be bailed out of the Hollywood jail by members of the production staff. This apparently caused so much annoyance that it was a major factor in phasing Starscream out of this series. I have no idea if that's true. It's literally a direct quote from the guy that I found on TF Wiki. But I don't think it's much of a stretch if that was indeed the case to assume that even if Wheeljack and Sparkplug, who Lotta also voiced, weren't written out for this reason, it certainly wasn't a point in their favor to keep them around either, which is why Wheeljack is dead and Sparkplug is never seen again. Yep. And some irony for the few of the original season one and two Transformers that survived. Cliffjumper survived, but Casey Kasem quit early in season three due to a rather racist episode, Thief in the Night, so Cliffjumper was basically retired at this point. As was Blue Streak, if he even survived. If you're unaware, Casey Kasem was of Lebanese descent and involved with various related political things over the course of his life. Thief in the Night is not great about its portrayal of the Middle East, and he was, I think, very understandably upset about that portrayal. I'd be really upset, too. (laughs) Jazz survived, but sadly his voice actor, Scatman Crothers, passed away shortly thereafter. So while Jazz is seen in later background shots, he has no more speaking lines and thus doesn't feature heavily in season three or four. Leaving poor little Bumblebee as one of the very few original Autobots that are still alive and active in the plot. I mean, otherwise it's just like the Dinobots. Well, they weren't there in like the original ones in the arc though. Like I they think Bumblebee was the original one. Like one, 
I want to say Bumblebee was the only original one that like survived and was active in the plot. Yeah, but I think the Dinobots came in in season one at least. Oh yeah, yeah, they did. I, I think the distinction on the wiki was talking about how Bumblebee was on the original crew for the arc or something like that. Fair. Though I guess it depends on uh, what you're basing it off of, because in Marvel, in the Marvel comics. The Dinobots were on the arc. Yeah, no, no, they were but... talking about the cartoon specifically. And like, what does that tell you that he's like the only one still there? <laughs> and there were so many more Autobots than the Decepticons in those earlier plots. And more of the Decepticons survived! <laughs> like, almost all of them! <laughs> well, much higher okay, proportion. I guess not almost all of them, if I count Thunderbird and Star Wars being dead, but still. <laughs> And lastly, a little note I'd like to share from the TF Wiki. According to Dan Galvezin in his autobi autobiography, Bumblebee and Me, because the recording room at Wally Burr's studio was so small, most of the cast would have to wait their turn in the lobby. Scatman Crothers would bring his guitar to every recording session and perform for his fellow cast members to keep them entertained during the lengthy wait times. I think that is so sweet. Aww. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> Sounds like he was such a sweet guy. Yeah, I know. I'm like, oh, that's that like that's so sweet and so sad all at the same time. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I thought that I, th I saw that and was just like, oh, that is like so nice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but on that nugget, <laughs> um, join us next time for the beginning of season three. Yeah, which is. The Five Faces of Darkness, part one, I believe. Yeah, part one of five. Yeah, part one of five, because I like pain. <laughs> oh, well, we're both doing this. We both like pain. <laughs> we're here for the pain. <sighs> and that just about wraps it up for us today. Remember to check us out on Tumblr or Pillowfort as AfterSpark-Podcast for any additional information, show notes, or links we may have mentioned. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter at AfterSparkPod, all one word, and various other locations by searching for AfterSpark Podcasts such as AO3, iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube, just to name a few. And feel free to send us questions on Tumblr, YouTube, or AO3. Till next time, I'm Spex. And I'm Els. Toodles. Sorry, now I've got sudden fear about whether or not the rubber ducky came with the cat. Oh, yeah, like, I, I, I have you seen him?